Okay, so as we've seen so far uh, in the workshop, um, gravitational wave data for single events consists of this time series data in several detectors. And we usually think of this as consisting of um, some signal um, waveforms, which I'm going to denote h as a function of the parameters theta. These parameters would then be, you know, the masses, spins, orientation, and uh, location of, of some gravitational wave event, plus some noise, which is usually assumed to be stationary and Gaussian, and uh, it had with some power spectral density um, that's uh, measured in each detector, and where this this can this PSD can change over time. Okay, now given. If, if suppose you, you split this, uh, this data into this signal, you split off this signal, based on the signal you can determine what the parameters were that gave rise to that. And that's, that's obtained using Bayes' theorem, which gives you the probability of some, some, your belief about some parameters given that measured data d. Now the reason this posterior distribution is not just some point is because the division of, this, of the data into signal and noise is not um, not completely um, unique, and uh, you could, you know, pick a different noise realization uh, if you choose different parameters for your signal, which would slightly change the signal. So you have some spread over what you, your knowledge of, of, of the parameters. Okay, so that posterior distribution, as we've seen so far, is, you know, given using Bayes' theorem, from, in, from, you know, this expression involving the likelihood, which is the probability of some data uh, d given the parameters, and that likelihood is, that assumes this stationary Gaussian noise. So it's basically, if you were to take your data and subtract off some proposed signal that corresponds to parameters theta, then that residual should be stationary Gaussian noise with some power spectral density uh, s. So in fact, you know, these, this, this quantity is, should also be conditioned on this power spectral density or your noise model, but we just don't typically write that. Okay, and then there's also the prior, which is, you know, less interesting. It, typically, it's taken for binary black holes to be uniform in the masses uh, over some range or, and uniformly distributed in the sky and, and in spins and so on. Okay, now we don't want to just write down the the posterior distribution. The goal of parameter estimation is to draw samples from the posterior distribution. Uh, so typically an algorithm like Markov chain Monte Carlo or nested sampling is used where essentially we just move around in parameter space and generate waveforms and evaluate the likelihood at each of these points in parameter space and in, in so doing we build up this distribution by keeping some of the samples depending on what, what the posterior is. So then we can build up these distributions. Okay, now there's uh, a couple challenges with this approach. One is it's, it's quite expensive. So typical parameter estimation runs can require millions of likelihood evaluations, each of which requires the simulation of a waveform. And there's different waveform models, so some of them are faster to evaluate other ones that incorporate more physics, uh, might be slower, and also, there's different waveform lengths, like a binary neutron star waveform is much longer. So this can end up adding up to days to weeks to, to analyze a single gravitational wave event. And this is becoming problematic as detectors become more sensitive. So here's the rate, here's the number of, the total number of detections as a function of time during the LIGO-Virgo runs, and you can see that the rate is, is increasing and this is only going to get, uh, get you know, faster. So we have to analyze a lot of events, and they all have to be done individually. And also, it would be great to have faster inference in order to give fast electromagnetic alerts, fast alerts for you know, people to point their electromagnetic telescopes in the sky. Okay, the other sort of challenge related to this is that the, this, uh, this having a likelihood imposes this restriction to stationary Gaussian noise. And this is fortunate that, you know, the noise is almost stationary and Gaussian in many cases, uh, but there are also instrumental glitches and, um, you know, noise artifacts, and, this, and the noise is not quite stationary, so it would be good to be able to lift the, these restrictions. Uh, and right now we have to do things like, you know, model the glitch and subtract it explicitly. 
So the, the commonality between both of these challenges is they both require likelihood evaluations. And uh, in, in, so the solution that I'm going to talk about in this, this class, in this uh, course, or in this lecture, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, it's been a while since I've done an in-person lecture, uh, is to just stop evaluating likelihoods. And this, this whole approach is called simulation-based inference. So in, in contrast to what you've heard earlier in the workshop, it is not always necessary to evaluate a likelihood. OK, now how do we, um, how do we get this information from the likelihood into, the, into our analysis if we don't actually evaluate it? Well, in general, if you have a distribution, so here the likelihood distribution, there's two things you can do with it. You can evaluate it. So for some, param for some data d, you can you know, evaluate what is the likelihood. And that is what underlies likelihood-based inference. But you can also sample from a distribution. So sampling from the likelihood, as I've written here, that corresponds to simulating data. So this is called simulation-based inference. Now in both cases, you use this distribution, the probability of data given parameters, but you just use it in different ways. So you're using the same information. But it, there are cases where you know, simulating, is, simulating um, data is easier than evaluating the likelihood. So for example, if you have glitches or you know, real noise, you can just simply inject you know, simulated waveforms into that real noise, and then you have a sample from your likelihood in this, in the, in this sense, or you have simulated data. But you, you don't have a, a real way of evaluating on that. So we're not going to really take advantage of, of this, this fact in this, uh, in this talk, since I'm just going to be using stationary Gaussian noise. But that's something to be kept in mind that in the future, it, it would be interesting to explore um, the, these situations. OK, so this idea of simulation-based inference has been around for a long time. But what has happened in the past few years is that there have been new um, deep learning ways of representing probability distributions. And just to give you a preview, here I'm showing some results that we produced using, um, th this, is a, this is a posterior distribution for the first gravitational wave detection produced using our simulation-based inference deep learning approach and comparing it against LAL inference MCMC. And just to show you, I mean, the results are in very close agreement, you can see in the figure. Uh, so I just want to dispel any um, notion that you can't get uncertainty estimates with machine learning approaches, because we have them. So the rest of this talk is, is going to explain how we, we, we came to produce this. So the, the central object that will be of interest here is this, uh, this uh, neural network conditional probability distribution, or a neural density estimator that I'm going to uh, denote Q. So did, to distinguish from the actual posterior, which is P. This is a, you know, this is a, a, you know, a, a conditional probability distribution that's given in some way using some deep learning approach, so using a neural network. And it has the property of having extremely fast sampling and de density estimation. So if we could train this by tuning all these parameters of the neural network, in, in, in such a way so that this becomes a good approximation to the posterior distribution, then we could use it to perform inference. And what we're going to want to do is train it for all possible data sets D that we might encounter, which means then that when data arrives, we can just very quickly produce posterior samples, uh, as many as we want, um, for that data. So that really speeds up inference. The idea is we front load all of our computation into the training time, and then we amortize all of those costs over the inference time, which is very fast. And importantly, to train this to become a good approximation to the posterior, we use simulated data, but no actual posterior samples. So even though we're training this distribution to become a good approximation to the posterior, we don't actually have to have posteriors to train it, which I think is, is critically important because posteriors are expensive to produce. OK, and then when we're done, we can think of this as a surrogate for the posterior distribution that we could um, then use just like a surrogate for a waveform, but going the opposite direction. OK, 
Now, the machine learning uh, tool that we're going to use is called a normalizing flow. And this is just, this is how we're going to represent our distributions. It's just a mapping that depends on the data from a simple probability distribution. So just, to, uh, you know, a, a standard normal distribution in the same number of dimensions as your parameter space into the more complicated distribution. So you just push around the samples in a way that depends on the data. Uh, and if you define it in this way to, by pushing around the samples, then that's just a change of variables on your, on your, on your, on your sample space. So your, your distribution Q of, of theta given D is given by this expression here, where you would just, if you wanted to evaluate Q for some theta, you would apply the inverse uh, flow to that and evaluate the normal distribution on that inverse element and on that inverse sample. And then you multiply it by this uh, Jacobian factor. But if you want a sample from, from, your, from your distribution Q, which is your, ultimately going to be your posterior, you just have to sample from the normal distribution, which is super fast and, and easy, and then you apply the mapping. Now, for this to work, the normalizing flow has to satisfy two properties. It has to be invertible so that you can actually you know, evaluate uh, F inverse of theta. And it has to have a simple enough Jacobian determinant so that you can e evaluate this factor here. And there's been a lot of work in the machine learning community to develop uh, ways of parameterizing such functions or such mappings using neural networks. So essentially the neural network will, you know, take the data that you have and produce this parameterized function that satisfies the appropriate properties, okay? And then, of course, once we're done, since neural networks are usually very fast, it's just going to require forward passes to, to, to produce samples or to evaluate the density. It, this, this gives you something that is very fast to evaluate or sample from and sample from. Okay, so just to give a sense on how, of how these, these, these functions are constructed, we're going to use something called a coupling transform. So if you have, say, your 15 parameters for your, your uh, binary black hole merger, you take half of the parameters, you hold that fixed, and then you transform the other half of the, of the parameters element-wise in a way that depends on what the values of these fixed parameters are and also depends on the data. So, so you're doing these element-wise transformations, and if, these, if that, that element-wise element transformation CI is differentiable and has an analytic inverse with respect to UI, then the whole transformation is obviously invertible, and it has a simple Jacobian determinant because of this diagonal structure of this transformation. And the idea would be we do this coupling and then we scramble all the parameters, just mix them up, and then do another coupling flow, and we iterate this a few times, like maybe 30 times, and then we get a really flexible transformation. We're using something called a spline flow, which is, I said these things were new, this thing was invented in 2019, and this just to give a sense of, of these CIs, so, and, how, and how they depend on, on uh, the neural network. So here, each of the CIs is taken to be this spline function, which is defined by a set, set of knots, these, these black dots, and the derivative of the function at the knots. So these knots and derivatives, those are what's output from the neural network, which takes as input the untransformed parameters and the data. Now, then in between these, these knots, it's just filled in using a spline. So this obviously has an analytic inverse if these derivatives are positive, so which is just drawn here in orange, and also it's differentiable. So this is the kind of transformation that's, that's involved. But then when you make this sequence of transforms, you end up with a very complicated Q. Okay, so that's, that's how you build, you know, even though neural networks are really just tunable nonlinear functions, you can build probability distributions out of them using techniques like this. So how do you train this? This is a simulation-based training. So if we have this distribution Q, and we want it to become a good approximation to the posterior, we could try to minimize the, the, the uh, cross-entropy between the two distributions. 
So when you train a neural network, you specify some function that you, you try to minimize by tuning the network parameters. So we could, we could try to minimize that cross entropy and we could take, since we want this to work for all possible D that we would encounter, we can take the expectation also over the probability of the data D. But this is written in this form, this is not the easiest integral to evaluate or just because we would have to first, if we wanted to use a Monte Carlo approximation, we would have to first sample from P of D, which I don't know how to do. And then we would have to produce a posterior distribution and sample from that. However, Bayes' theorem comes to the rescue and we can just reverse the order of these two uh, expectation values. So if we, and this is much, much more tractable. So if we can, so, so we can evaluate this using a Monte Carlo approximation by first sampling from the prior distribution. So for this outer one, and that's easy. And then we simulate data based on these parameters theta i. So simulating data just means I generate a waveform using whichever waveform model I want to use in this analysis. And then I add a noise realization that's consistent with the detector noise. And then if I do this a bunch of times, I can, I can write down an approximation to this loss function and tune my network parameters to, to minimize this in, in some um, stochastic gradient descent. But notably, we could also not use a stationary Gaussian noise here. We could just use real noise. Like we could literally take noise from the detector and in inject signals into it. And that would be a perfectly valid thing to do. And then we would train our network to do inference based on this noise model, the, the data-driven noise model. But we're not doing that in this talk. I just wanted to point that out. OK, so here's the picture we have. Again, so we have this, this we're, we're expressing the posterior in terms of a mapping from normally distributed variables u. So we have this mapping f that flows between the normally distributed variables and the posterior samples, and this depends on the data d. Uh, okay, but actually it, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated than this. We have to, I mean, this is the basic level, but we have to make a bunch of, uh, you know, modifications to make this work well with gravitational waves. So the first issue is that our data is very high dimensional. Uh, we're using frequency domain data uh, in, you know, in, um, for eight seconds long at 1,024 hertz, and there's three detectors. So this adds up to tens of thousands of dimensions in the data. And we can't just condition the flow on this high dimensional uh, data directly. So we try to compress it using what's called an embedding network. This is just a neural network that reduces the dimensionality. And this is also going to be trained in conjunction with uh, the normalizing flow networks down here. And then the other problem, is, so that compresses the data. The other problem is at this point, we're not taking into account the fact that the noise power spectral density can vary from event to event. But in simulation-based inference, this is very easy to, to deal with this problem. We, all, we just also input the PSD along with the data to the embedding network. And then now our flow depends on the PSD SN. And now this posterior distribution is going to be conditioned on the SN, as it should be. So this is very important because this is what allows us to fully amortize our results across, across um, you know, events where the PSD is varying. This, this accounts for this non-stationarity. OK, and then just to stress also that like, this is a fairly complicated problem. So we have really big neural networks involved, roughly 350 layers and 150 million free parameters. But using these, we can really fit this inverse mapping from data to, to, uh, to, to um, posterior samples in this way. OK, just to give you uh, a, a bit more detail of that embedding network, so we have this uh, this input to the embedding network, which is roughly 24,000 dimensions uh, times the number of detectors that we have, which is two or three these days. And we found a way to really project this down to small number of dimensions. Uh, we first just apply a linear projection to it, which is seeded with the principal components of clean waveforms. So just the initial value of the of, of these uh, of this of these mat of this matrix, and this. This really projects out a lot of the noise as a very first step and brings it down to 400 components per 
uh, per detector. Uh, although we seed it with these, uh, these in this initial data, which are these principal component vectors, we allow those to uh, change during training. So it, it's not imposing any sort of restriction. And then after that, we have this like fully connected neural network, which is, well, in our case, 48 layers deep. And that provides a nonlinear compression to reduce it everything down to 128 components. And then that's passed to the flow. Uh, OK, so that, that was sort of a, that's the embedding network. I think one of the more interesting developments that we had to, uh, to make for this to really work properly is something we're calling group equivariant neural posterior estimation. And the issue is that among the parameters that we're trying to, to infer, uh, we have the sky position, which are the uh, right ascension and the declination, as well as the coalescence time TC. And this means that if we just put in all of, you know, you know we, we, we provide data that's consistent with the prior, including this, the sky position and coalescence time, if we, if we provide all of that data to the neural network, then it has to learn to interpret different arrival times of the data in each detector. And that's actually, uh, fairly hard for the neural network to do, uh, but and, and we found that this was really kind of impeding performance. So most of what the neural network was doing initially was trying to figure out when exactly the the data was arriving in each detector, rather than you know figuring out the other parameters. And so on the other hand, if we knew alpha, delta, and the time of coalescence in advance, we could have manually aligned the data to simplify the, the analysis. So essentially, that would have been transforming the data to, have, to come from some standardized direction in the sky and, and uh, arriving at some standardized time t equals 0 in the detectors. But we don't know this information a priori, so we can't do that. But we'd really like to incorporate the, the symmetry property of the data in, in, into the neural network so that it knows about it, and it does not have to learn it you know, on its own through training. So the approach we came up with to do this is to expand the parameter space, add two or three more parameters, uh, which are essentially blurred coalescence time. So if we have the exact coalescence time, we convolve it with some narrow kernel to kind of smear it out. So these are these t hat variables. And then we, so, so then we consider the joint posterior over theta and t hat. And then we use Gibbs sampling to recover the, the uh, original, uh, to, to sample from this uh, posterior. So the, with Gibbs sampling, you sample ti, and then you sample t hat, i conditional on that, and you just derive samples in this way. Now, why does this help us? Well. For, uh, so, so these two Gibbs iterations are as follows. So when we sample theta, our, our, true, our, our non-smeared parameters, we, we condition that distribution on the, hat param the hatted parameters the, uh, with the blurred coalescence times. But when we condition on the t hat, we're allowed to apply the inverse t hat transformation to the data. So this is essentially aligning the data based on the t hat. So the neural network that we train here, this Q, it doesn't have to learn to interpret data arriving at many different coalescence times. Our other iteration, I mean, the other Gibbs iteration is very simple. This is just sampling t hat given t, and this is given by this fixed kernel. So this, this uh, neural density estimator, this first one, is much easier to learn than, the, uh, than what we were starting with. Now, there's some, sort, some freedom in, in terms of how you choose your kernel. And if you have a tighter kernel, it just means you're going to take more Gibbs iterations to sample the whole space. Uh, but it will mean that you also align your data better in each detector. So there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of performance of, of, of how well you can train your network versus how fast you can do inference. But just to give a visual uh, representation of this, I'm, I'm showing here uh, a posterior produced using MCMC and a posterior produced using the GNPE algorithm. And the GNPE starts off not a great approximation. And 
when I run it, though, it just, you know, learns how to, you know, align the data and do, you know, this inference. So we've really simplified the inference task by using these symmetries. And this uh, animation was, was made by, by, by Max, the student, and it's really, it, he designed it so this is actually the real-time inference. So this is as long as it takes to, to do this inference. So it's a, I don't know, this is um, 10, 20 seconds. So that's just how fast the whole thing is. Okay, so that, that's the, this group uh, equivariant neural posterior estimation. So with that, all that out of the way, what, what, here's what we did. We trained the neural network using uh, about 5 million training waveforms. So we used a simple IMR phenom PV2 waveform model. Uh, we considered eight second waveforms at, from 20 hertz to 1,024 hertz in frequency domain. And we did inference over the full 15D parameter space. The main limitation is our masses right now are, are between 10 and 80 solar masses. So we can't deal with binary neutron stars because that would entail much longer waveforms. Uh, but in the future, we're going to try to think about improved compression techniques to, to deal with longer waveforms. We also add to this stationary Gaussian noise realizations consistent with the PSD. And we, we draw these, these noise realizations at, uh, at, um, during training rather than in advance. I should say also the extrinsic parameters here, we can, uh, for these waveforms, we can very quickly... Uh, they represent very simple transformations of waveforms, so that we, we draw the extrinsic parameters at inference time as well. Uh, the, PSD is, the PSDs are drawn from, some, from a data set that we built of, of PSDs, or real PSDs, during uh, an observing run, and we just draw one of those uh, at inference time. So we, we, did, we built several networks, one for each observing run, 01 and 02, and for different numbers of detectors. Okay. Now, I think one advantage of producing, uh, you know, uncertainty estimates in addition to just point estimate, rather than point estimates for parameter estimation, is that that gives you the possibility to really validate your methods, uh, because that's, I think that's always important with machine learning. And so one uh, way of validating this is to make this so-called PP plot, which essentially we do a thousand injections of of simulated data, and we we know the true parameters for this, and we make sure that these are appropriately distributed within the posterior distributions that we get. So, for each each parameter, we can compute the uh, the percentile score of, of within the one D marginal posterior, and these should be uniformly distributed. And this is plotting the cumulative distribution function of these parameters, and it should lie close to the diagonal if this is to be, uh, if this is working properly. And we can see here that it does. So in brackets here, we have these Kolmogorov, Smirnov test um, scores, and they all lie appropriately between zero and one. Now this is really a, a test of the performance within the distribution because we're, we trained it on these uh, simulated waveforms and we're evaluating it on simulated waveforms. It's also important to test it on sort of out of distribution, uh, uh, out of distribution data. So meaning real data in our case. And for that, what we can come, our best way of, of doing this is to compare posteriors against standard tools. I don't know of any sort of other tests beyond this. Um, so here's our, again our result for GW 1509.14, and visually you can see that. I mean, the posteriors are just dead on with each other. And uh, so visually, this looks like a very good match. And I should stress that two things. One is that this, produced, this technique will produce 50,000 samples in 20 seconds, which is you know, comparable to you know, a day using standard tools. And also, I want to emphasize that I said this before, but we never put in anything that looks like this posterior. We didn't train it on posteriors. We just trained it on simulated data. But nevertheless, it, it figures out how to make these posteriors. OK, we, we also analyzed it on um, eight events from the first gravitational wave transient catalog. Uh, and I'm plotting the mass distributions, comparing our approach to Lal inference again. So Lal inference, I don't know if you can see it, but it's in this light gray surrounding these 90%, or along with the, the colored ones, really. Uh, but they're just right on top of each other for the most part. Uh, we also have the sky position 
which, again, the posterior, so these 90% credible regions are lying right on top of each other. Okay, but we can also make quantitative comparisons against standard samplers. Uh, so one, one approach which is common is to compute the JS divergence, which measures a sort of distance between probability distributions. So for each 1D posterior and for each event, we can compute this JSD. And what's been found is that if the JSD is less than, than about 2 times 10 to the minus 3 nats, uh, that that is well. That's roughly the difference between uh, two different Lal inference runs. So if it's less than that, these are considered indistinguishable distributions. And for the most part, not in every case, but for the most part, these numbers are below two. And and um, yeah, that shows that the results are nearly indistinguishable. We can also look at the median and ninety percent credible intervals. Uh, I mean, you can just look at these numbers. They're pretty much dead on for these events. OK, so now I just want to make a sort of summary comparison between the standard likelihood-based inference and this neural posterior estimation. Uh, well, the first is the, the basic difference is likelihood-based inference requires having a likelihood, whereas uh, NPE requires simulated data. And I, as I've tried to argue, this is going to allow for more accurate inference going forward because we can use real noise. Uh, second, uh, all of the costs of neural posterior estimation are front loaded. We have to de generate all of the data, which is going to be proportional to the waveform generation time, but it can be parallelized. And then training takes about 10 days on um, A100 GPU, whereas likelihood based inference doesn't have any of these upfront costs. Where we get the real gain is that. Standard inference tools might take hours to weeks, and it's per the time for inference is proportional to the waveform generation time because that's the, the likelihood evaluation time, whereas it only takes a few seconds uh, with our approach. Uh, so you're really putting all of your costs up front and then doing very quick inference afterwards. Now, I, I mentioned with the, with the, there's this trade-off with the, with the GNPE where we can choose a different kernel size and we, we chose, for that demonstration where it takes about 20 seconds, we chose a fairly narrow kernel so as to get more accurate results. But if you take a wider kernel, you can get away with, in fact, just one GNPE iteration and get slightly less accurate inference in about a second. And another thing which I should stress is that when you use MCMC, your samples are going to be somewhat correlated uh, with each other. At, and, and you, you do use approaches like thinning of your chain and throwing out the, the, the first uh, part of the chain. But NPE gives you completely independent samples because you just have to draw independent samples from the Gaussian or the, the standard normal distribution, your base distribution, and apply the mapping. OK, so to conclude, uh, I hope I've gotten across that machine learning algorithms can produce full posterior distributions, including uncertainties. Uh, the, for generic BBH events, we can now get results that are nearly indistinguishable from those of standard codes. Uh, but it's much faster, taking about 20 seconds per event. And we can account for the noise non-stationarity non from event to event. And we're still developing a, a user-friendly code, which we're calling Dingo. And uh, hopefully that will be ready in a few weeks. And we'll make it available on GitHub. And also, more to the future, simulation-based inference is, I think, more flexible because it doesn't require a likelihood, so especially for dealing with uh, you know, more realistic noise. A bit of an outlook uh, for LVK inference, or ground-based detector inference, we really would like to extend to binary neutron stars. We have an idea for how to do this by changing the sampling rate depending on, uh, depending on the, the time during the merger. Just taking advantage of the fact that uh, there's this chirp in the signal where the, the frequency increases with time. This is, uh, this is called multibanding, and it would be very straightforward to apply that. Uh, and also, to, we would like to use more realistic waveform models that have uh, you know, higher radiation multiples and precession. Um, and I think both of these are going to require somewhat larger neural networks to deal with the increased complexity. And then there's also the, the prospect of using real detector noise 
Uh, for Lisa, there's a whole bunch of different problems. One question is, can this be adapted to, to deal with multiple overlapping events? And finally, um, uh, I, there's been some approaches, some people have applied similar tools to population inference, and I'm interested in, in seeing if there's ways to speed up analyses or if there are problems that might involve intractable likelihoods that we could approach using a, a simulation-based inference framework. And I'm happy to discuss at this workshop if anybody has any sort of applications that, that they're interested in. Thanks.